welcome to Banknotes and Shin Plasters, the Rage for Paper Money in the Early Republic. I'm Catherine Algar, and I'm the president here at the Massachusetts Historical Society, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this program. One of my favorite parts about the Historical Society is that we strive so much to give basically to give everything away for free. Not only wonderful programs like this, but um, we actually have fellowships. We pay people to use our stuff for their research. Uh, anyone's welcome to come in when we're open and get a professional librarian to help them with the research on their family or town. We have free teacher training. We defray the cost of history day. We love giving things away for free. But in this season of light and gratitude and appreciation, we would urge you to go to masthist.org and find our little support button, give it a little tap, and maybe share a little bit of gratitude with us. Um, love to have a donation, of course, in any amount, but the really special thing is if you would become a member, you would then be part of the family, and that's what we like. So with this little prelude with about paper money, I'm gonna let Gavin uh, introduce our speaker, Gavin. Thank you, Catherine. So uh, welcome to everyone and thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Gavin Cleespies and I'm the Director of Programs, Exhibitions and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society. We have a special event this evening. We'll explore the history of paper money with uh, Joshua Greenberg. Prior to the establishment of greenbacks and a national bank network uh, in the Civil War era, the average American had to navigate through thousands of unique legal banknotes and avoid a plethora of counterfeit bills as, way, as well as countless shin plasters of questionable legal issue uh, that were released by unregulated merchants, firms, and municipalities. Remarkably, many people became quite adept at steering through these difficult waters. Mr. Greenberg will tell us of the lost skill of evaluating the legality of money. Uh, Josh Greenberg is the editor of Commonplace, the Journal of Early American Life. He received his undergraduate education at the University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, and then went on to earn a master's and a doctorate degree from American University. Now, without further ado, I'm going to invite uh, our speaker today, Joshua Greenberg, to join us. Thank you to uh, Gavin. Thank you, uh, everyone from the MHS. Uh, it's really great to sort of virtually be back at the MHS, where I did actually a lot of the research uh, for this book, uh, Banknotes and Shim Plasters, when I was there uh, several years ago. Um, the, thank you for everyone for joining me today. The, the book that I'm talking about today, Banknotes and Shim Plasters, The Rage for Paper Money in the Early Republic, uh, covers a lot of different aspects of early republic paper money. Um, I talk about how bankers engineered uh, currency circulation to maximize profits and how Americans lived experiences within the banknote system affected things like their political engagement. But for today, I really want to concentrate on the material culture of paper money and how the public used currency as monetary information. Um, accumulating monetary information was uh, really important and central to uh, sort of getting through the craziness of the banknote system and the notes themselves become an important part of that process. Uh, first, before I get into that, I think I should explain a little bit about what made early Republic paper money so complicated. Um, with a couple of sort of uh, odd exceptions, the federal government didn't really circulate any paper money between the passage of the constitution and a civil war. And instead it was thousands of local banks that produced, produced their own unique currency. And so I wanted to sort of start just by showing you an image of this uh, banknote from the Bank of New England at Goodspeed's Landing uh, in East Haddam, Connecticut. And what you see here is a $2 bill uh, sort of you know, branded uh, from not only this one bank uh, in Connecticut, but also with a vi central vignette uh, depicting uh, East Haddam, Connecticut, depicting the Connecticut River uh, here. And right at the, the center of it is a steamer uh, ship actually called the, um, the city of Hartford, uh, sort of uh, just right up the road or right up the uh, river, I should say. Um, these sort of local touches and, and, and local branding on these notes, um, you know, sort of multiplied out. So you literally had thousands of unique bills all circulating simultaneously. Uh, and for the American public, that meant having to navigate this sort of crazy system uh, with all these different types of currency. 
The thing about these notes that made them so difficult to deal with is that they could trade at face value uh, near the bank that issued them, or they would have a discounted rate often based on um, how far they traveled from the bank that issued them, or they would have a discount if there was a perceived um, uh, fear that they wouldn't be able to be redeemed uh, properly for uh, gold or silver coins if they were brought back to the institution that issued them. Uh, what this meant is that if you had a note that was circulating near the bank that issued it, it could circulate at face value. Uh, but the further away it got, or if the bank had, had sort of public questions about uh, you know, how reputable it was, it would be traded at a discount. And that discount could be a small discount or a very large one, depending on these factors. Separate from banknotes like this, uh, this, there was also a huge number of shin plasters uh, that circulated simultaneously. Uh, shin plasters uh, is the name given to notes from non-bank entities. Um, there, there was a whole bunch of uh, different types of organizations or corporations or companies that issued their own versions of currency. Sometimes the, it was legal for them to do so. Sometimes it was illegal for them to do so. Often it, uh, these notes operated in sort of a gray area between legal and illegal uh, based on sort of local currency needs. Uh, the first example of this would be a merchant issuing a shin plaster. Uh, we see here the store at Allegheny Furnace in Pennsylvania issuing a five cent note uh, that could be redeemed on demand in dry goods or groceries at the store. Uh, this note wouldn't do you much good if you were you know, at a distance from Allegheny Furnace, uh, but locally, especially if the store had a decent reputation, it could circulate no different than other types of paper money. In addition to merchant shin plasters, you could also see transportation companies in issuing their own uh, shin plasters. Uh, this example here, comes from the Easton and Wilkes-Barre Turnpike Company uh, in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, uh, issuing a note that they promised uh, you know, to pay uh, back on demand a dollar uh, in 1816. Uh, you even see a vignette uh, of uh, you know, a, a, a wagon uh, up top. Uh, again, as you, you know, if you're in a turnpike company uh, issuing notes and you're somewhere along that turnpike company, this, is, this can be a valuable note for you to use uh, and it, you know, it can hold its value quite well. The further a note like this got from the turnpike, uh, the less value or even no value it might carry. Uh, in addition to merchants and transportation companies, uh, another category of shin plaster are those issued by municipal corporations. Um, this particular one uh, that I wanted to show uh, was issued from the district of, I think it's pronounced Southwark in, uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, this was a, a panic of 1837 era note uh, that was issued um, for a dollar bearing an interest rate of 1% a year, uh, but not payable until 1839. Uh, so the idea that this is what you know, sort of was in theory a loan, a sort of municipal loan, uh, but the note itself would circulate locally sort of as currency with the idea that it would be worth something greater in the future. Uh, and again, during the Panic of 1837, when banks were failing and banknotes were losing uh, value, uh, municipal shin plasters like this sometimes stepped into the breach there to... Uh, um, increase the, the currency flow in, an, in a given area. Uh, in addition to these type of examples of shin plasters that could be redeemed for you know, whatever terms the, the institution uh, created, there were other institutions that issued some shin plasters that looked more like banknotes and tried uh, to really copy the banknote model. Uh, this shin plaster here is, was issued by the Franklin Silk Company uh, in Ohio. And you know, one of the things notable about it, aside from the sort of you know, lo the lovely vignette on top, um, 
is that the Franklin Silk Company never actually produced any silk. Uh, in theory, it was trying to do so. Uh, but for, for much of its existence, its business model really operated around issuing paper money uh, like this. The shin plasters that it issues uh, that it issued were really what uh, sort of its business was uh, because it wasn't producing any silk. Um, and so, you know, these weird notes were uh, issued by non-bank entities circulated alongside of uh, bank-related uh, or bank notes issued by actual banks and all of this sort of operating at once. So for Americans trying to navigate the market, uh, they were inundated with different types of paper um, and the, you know, the problem here is that you had to try and figure out if you were you know, sort of an average American here, uh, were these good notes, were these bad notes and what to make of them. Uh, one of the difficulties you know, in using notes like this is that you know, it, it really mattered what the note was and when you were trying to use it. And so I wanted to turn to an example to, so we can look at you know, what did it mean in the economy to use this paper money in practice. Um, this is a note from the, the Bank of East Tennessee uh, in Knoxville. Uh, looks like sort of a standard issue banknote of the era. The, the Bank of East Tennessee opened in 1850. This note is from 1855. Uh, the bank itself, however, issued huge numbers of banknotes and they really didn't have enough gold and silver sitting in their vault to support uh, the number of bills and the amount uh, that they were issuing. Uh, unfortunately, bills like this $20 bill, they look respectable, uh, but they held, uh, you know, sort of not great value uh, because back in Knoxville, uh, it, it, they couldn't necessarily be redeemed properly. The bank wound up failing in 1858. So the question becomes, if you know, if you're in somewhere like New York City and someone tries to hand you a note like this uh, in the years before the bank failed, what was it really worth? Well, you know it's not going to be worth face value because you're in New York and New York is about 700 miles away from Knoxville. And so you wouldn't be able to easily bring it back to Knoxville for a full redemption. So the question becomes, how do you assess its value? It looks like a regular you know, banknote, just as good as maybe another one. One thing you could do is maybe go to a newspaper. Uh, a lot of newspapers carried uh, what were called banknote tables, uh, little charts or, or lists of information that gave you current money market rates, uh, literal money market rates to tell you uh, what different banks notes were trading at uh, in New York at that moment. And so if you looked at one of the bank, those banknote tables, for instance, in December of 1856, you would see that the Bank of East Tennessee's notes were actually trading at a 75% discount, a huge discount. And you'd have to figure out, well, what's going on there? Um, what happened was that a few weeks earlier, there had been a run on the bank. Uh, questions about how solvent the bank was led to lots of people trying to redeem their notes as to not lose the value of them. The bank actually said, well, we're not going to pay out anything anymore. And since in December of 1856, there were all these questions about the bank's solvency and the bank wasn't paying anything out, this $20 bill was only worth $5 in New York City. At a different time and at a different place in its circulation, it could have been worth as high as face value. Uh, so the problem for Americans is that they had to repeat this sort of daily scramble to collect enough monetary information every time they encountered a new piece of paper money, especially if it was from out of town and they had to determine what type of discount to take off of face value. Complicating this even further, Demographic factors like race, class, gender, uh, and social standing of the parties involved in these banknote transactions mattered a lot in the outcome of the negotiation. Uh, it mattered if it was a white middle-class merchant uh, or a female factory worker who was offering a note uh, for sale or you know, to use. And it also mattered if it was an African-American barber, uh, a white uh, middle-class farmer, uh, or an enslaved woman in a market who was receiving the banknote. The negotiation over what type of discount 
to provide uh, on that note uh, would, you know, would look very different depending on who was involved in the transaction. No two of these banknote transactions looked the same depending on the time, the place, the individuals involved, and the piece of paper in front of them. What this meant was that Americans were in a constant uh, sort of scramble to accumulate as much monetary information as they could every time they needed to use a banknote. They needed to make sense of the complex monetary world they lived in and rationalize as much as possible their banknote transactions. There was really no better resource for doing this than the seemingly endless collection of vignettes and imagery and symbols on the notes themselves. Uh, Americans used the notes as uh, material culture uh, sort of documents in order to accumulate monetary information. Because notes were originally issued by most banks as loans, uh, they would send the notes out as loans and then the notes would circulate until the time that they came back for redemption. But in the meanwhile, as they were circulating, the bank would be making money off of the interest from the loan. So it behooved the bank to have note, their notes circulate as long as possible because they wanted a longer circulation. They wanted to get the public to trust their notes, to provide, you know, to place confidence in the notes and therefore in the institution itself. Uh, Banknote producers therefore utilized different imagery and created or tried to create visually enticing bills uh, that, that might forge an emotional connection between the banknote holders uh, and the notes themselves in order to sort of secure confidence in the note and a longer circulation. But there was no one single recipe uh, in this process. I wanted to look through some of the different types of vignettes that appeared on these notes uh, in, in terms of this sort of um, goal by banknote producers to try and make visually enticing bills uh, that might increase their, the, their circulation. Uh, but I should say I'm really sort of just scratching the surface of the types of notes uh, or imagery on these notes in order to sort of explain this. Uh, what we see often is um, a goal with the notes of creating a picture of sort of local economic strength. Uh, you know, to look at first, we see a note from the Merchants and Mechanics Bank of Monroe, Michigan. Uh, what you see up on top here, this vignette is a, a bustling uh, sort of urban marketplace, lots of economic activity. It looks like a thriving place uh, with lots of business going on. Uh, it's got a good port. There's barrels being loaded. Uh, really, gr you know, great place to do business. Uh, the idea behind an image like this, supposedly showing, you know, uh, Monroe and its thriving economy at, at a time when Monroe was sort of a boom town on the Michigan frontier. Uh, you know, the idea behind a note like this is the idea that if you could create in the public's mind the idea of Monroe as a economically successful, booming uh, economy, uh, they might potentially transfer the confidence that they might have in Monroe's economy, the local economy there, to the confidence that they might have in a bank like the Merchants and Mechanics Bank that is situated in that town. Um, more confidence in the economy, more confidence in the bank, more confidence in the bank note, uh, leads to longer circulation and more profit for the institution. Uh, one of the ways that this was done in, in a sort of variety of different vignettes was to not just focus on sort of uh, images of booming economic street scenes, but to, to focus in on regional economic production. Again, if you could create an image of uh, sort of successful regional economic production on a note, somehow tie that note's uh, economy to the bank, uh, it would be something that someone might trust or want to uh, sort of provide some confidence. Uh, we see here, as an example of this, a note from Lexington, North Carolina, the Bank of Lexington uh, in North Carolina here, uh, with a really detailed sort of beautiful vignette of uh, wheat harvesting going on uh, in the center. Uh, and two side images uh, where women holding sickles 
uh, are also sort of contributing to the sort of the strength of the the, the wheat harvest and this this sort of farming regional production uh, that is being broadcast uh, on the bank of Lexington note here. Uh, the idea again, just as we saw above in the note from Ron Rowe, uh, a booming uh, wheat harvest, a strong economy means that this must be a successful bank. Uh, there must be gold and silver in the vaults. This is a banknote of $10 worth trusting. I'm going to pass it along. I'm going to circulate it. Uh, and I'm going to not question uh, whether or not you know, it's worth uh, face value. This type of economic production is shown in a variety of different formats. Uh, one of the places that we see this uh, is in the Miners and Planters Bank uh, from Murphy, North Carolina. Uh, we see both of these sort of miners and planters images uh, uh, represented by different vignettes on this note. Uh, what you see up on top are enslaved African-American men in a cotton field with a white overseer on a horse. Uh, and next to that, you see white uh, miners uh, in Western uh, North Carolina here. Uh, something that, that's sort of important to note in, in these types of economic, regional economic production uh, vignettes uh, is an important, uh, you know, subtext going on here. Remember that if what's the goal of an image like this is to project a certain sort of picture of economic strength and to have that economic strength then tied to the banknote and tied to the institution, uh, it's important for us also to remember that the bodies performing the labor in these vignettes, whether it's enslaved black bodies uh, picking cotton uh, or it's uh, working class white bodies mining marble in, uh, in Western North Carolina, uh, those individuals are not the ones reaping the profit uh, you know, from, the, uh, from the banknotes that are both exploiting the imagery of their labor uh, and, and, you know, picturing the exploited labor at the same time. Uh, sort of all of this exists on a note uh, like this Miners and Planters Bank, uh, projecting certain types of, uh, you know, uh, economic imagery in order to, in theory, create more faith and confidence in the note and its um, stability. Uh, other types of, uh, resource extraction work are pictured uh, aside from uh, mining. Uh, I wanted to just quickly mention this uh, Bank of Commerce note where there's a number of great vignettes here uh, from Savannah, Georgia. Uh, but we see on the right here, uh, an image of a lumberjack. Uh, lumberjacks you know, show up as resource extraction um, uh, workers in a number of different notes. Uh, you also on the the left-hand side, uh, see a vignette of cattle being driven to market uh, underneath uh, a telegraph uh, line. Uh, this sort of mixture of economic production and um, a technological um, a sort of uh, technological advancement uh, is another feature of these uh, these banknotes. You don't want to be in in sense uh, too stuck. Uh, in your in your production ways, without also noting uh, that you're sort of hip to uh, technological and economic changes, and your bank is on the you know the, the forefront of that as well. Uh, one more place we might see this kind of mixture uh, is in this uh, specimen note from the Oil City Bank of Oil City, Pennsylvania. Uh, this is a later note from the Civil War era, but we see both of those. Uh, two types of vignettes I was just describing. Uh, on the left, uh, you know, a, a detailed note of uh, a railroad showing again sort of uh, modern transportation uh, and technological uh, economics here. And then on the right, a really sort of uh, unbelievably detailed uh, vignette of oil production. Uh, you know, again, this is the note from the Oil City Bank uh, in that region of Pennsylvania, where there was an oil boom at the time, um, and that what um, you know what one New York Times writer referred to uh, that area as petroleum. Uh, the idea again behind these images is to create uh, you know pictures of economic strength that hopefully both rub off on the banknote, uh, but also on the institution that issued them. Um, industrial and artisanal labor are also pictured. 
uh, as different examples of regional economic production, um, I wanted to uh, put up this uh, note from the Manual Labor Banking House, uh, which is sort of an interesting institution in Philadelphia. Uh, the main uh, vignette up on top is of a glass blowing uh, factory, sort of really a sort of neat image uh, for numismatists. They, they often refer to this as an Elvis, uh, this, this Elvis vignette uh, because of the glass blowers, uh, sort of white outfit um, in, in, the, in the middle of the vignette. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but what you see here again is sort of, you know, uh, finely skilled art, artisanal labor showing a particular, um, uh, you know, type of of specific regional economic production tied to this institution. Uh, the, the other thing that this institution does show us as we sort of shift to other types of vignettes that appear on notes is a picture of Ben Franklin on the left-hand side. Um, you know, confidence or trust in a banknote is going to be manufactured or at least attempt to be manufactured in different ways not only with economic images, but also with patriotic or nationalistic images, uh, vignettes or in portraits of you know, uh, leading politicians um, and especially revolutionary era uh, figures pop up on all sorts of notes, again, in, in a different way of inspiring confidence and trust. Uh, Franklin is, is, a, is a, you know, featured in lots of notes. Uh, here we have a note from Philadelphia and obviously the ties between Franklin and Philadelphia become you know, manifest on a note like this. I should mention at the same time, not every individual whose portrait appears on a note uh, you know, is a famous politician or, or leader. Uh, the individual on the other side of the note uh, is Thomas Diet, who happens to be not only the president of this uh, banking institution uh, and the, the owner of the glass blowing factory that you see pictured above, uh, but a sort of, uh, you know, a industrialist um, and sort of interesting figure in Philadelphia in the era uh, who ran a community called Dietville. Uh, he would have been well known in Philadelphia and the area around there, uh, but not necessarily uh, someone uh, you know would be familiar with him uh, if the banknote traveled out of the Philadelphia area. Uh, so one of the questions you only have to ask yourself is if you pick this bill up in you know Virginia or Louisiana, um, you know you recognize Franklin, but what do you make of someone like Thomas Diet being on a note? Is this some someone you you know? give trust and confidence to, or you know, does, does, do you, does it give you a moment of pause because you don't recognize who the individual is? Uh, it's interesting to think about not only the game that the bank uh, note producers are playing in, in their decisions they make uh, in what vignettes wind up on the note, but obviously how the public receives these uh, vignettes and what they make of them when they come into their, uh, their hand. I should also uh, sort of note here that the patriotic imagery is not just of uh, portraits. Um, here's a note from the Jefferson Bank of New Salem, Ohio, uh, which the bank founded in Ohio just after the War of 1812. Um, and just a couple of years later, they issue uh, this note here that features uh, you know, a detailed but sort of early century um, vignette of Andrew Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans, a different type of patriotic image here, again, trying to confer some, uh, you know, trust and confidence in a note that uh, came from a bank that was highly suspect, wound up failing, you know, not too many years after the, the bank was founded. Um, and images like this, you know, grand patriotic uh, images, uh, tried, you know, visually at least, to instill some confidence uh, on, a, on the note of an institution uh, where there were a lot of questions. Uh, the attempt to elicit an emotional response to a banknote uh, came in a lot of different forms, not just with um, patriotic imagery like this, but sometimes, uh, you know, more fun or, uh, or exotic imagery. Uh, this is a note from the Howard Banking Company, uh, which is held at the Mass Historical Society, and you see right away the center vignette is of Santa Claus uh, on a rooftop being pulled uh, by reindeer. Uh, you know, this is not Ben Franklin. This is not a glass blowing uh, vignette. This is something more lighthearted, something more fun, something that 
you know, make um, a kind of uh, emotional connection to an audience. And, and Santa Claus does actually appear on a whole variety of different banknotes in the era, uh, including one from the Santa Claus Bank. Um, other images, you know, tended to be more risque. Um, there's a sort of a range of vignettes that appear on different types of banknotes and shin plasters uh, that tend to show uh, women in a reclined pose. Uh, often these women are wearing a classical garb. Uh, often that is uh, very sheer. Uh, we see here a note from the Commercial Exchange Bank in Terre Haute, Indiana, uh, featuring several women in a reclined pose, uh, wearing again, sort of classical, sort of sheer attire. Uh, often um, this type of pose could also be seen by Native American women, some who, of whom are topless. Uh, and a note like this, you know, creates a very different kind of, of emotional response. Uh, I should also note uh, that there were some notes that, you know, moved from the, the risque um, into the, you know, what you might even call uh, pornographic. Um, the back of this commercial exchange bank note from Terre Haute uh, includes a, a geographic design. It's a $2 note and it features a geographic design of two circles uh, made up of small number twos. And when you look at it close up, it looks like a just sort of interesting geographic, uh, uh, sort of a geometric uh, image. Stepping back, however, hold at, held at arm's length, uh, what is clear is it, by both the shading and the way that the, the number twos work in this design is that it me it's meant to represent uh, breasts. And so what you get in a note like this is a sort of the, the ability for an individual, both with the front vignettes and this back design, to carry what amounted to portable pornography um, you know, with them without having to carry you know, a book or a magazine that could be seen as scandalous. Um, sort of an interesting way, not only to think about what choices are being made by the person producing a banknote like this, but also how individuals might read or use uh, the imagery uh, on a note. Uh, for all of the work that's being done by banknote producers to try and convince the public uh, to bond uh, and trust these scraps of paper that they're putting out, banknote holders did not just accept bills as they were produced. And this is a really important point. Uh, banknote producers are choosing text and they're choosing uh, vignettes and imagery to try and you know, create a note that is uh, confidence worthy, that is trustworthy, that, th that will stay in circulation for a long time so that they can generate profits. But the public itself doesn't always go along with the project that the banknote producers have. They have their own reason for using the notes. They have their own reasons um, for, for holding or transferring the notes to other people. And they use the notes as they see fit. The public engaged with their cash as material objects, not just as representations of value. What this meant was that they sometimes manipulated paper money in a variety of ways after it was already in circulation. This could mean ripping notes in half. This could mean scribbling or writing on the notes, uh, many of which were only printed on one side uh, and had a back uh, of the note that was blank and ready to be used in a variety of different ways. Uh, one question you might ask yourself is, well, why would anyone rip up their own cash? Uh, there's a couple of different reasons why a person might do this. One example comes from a British traveler uh, named Henry Bradshaw Fearing. Uh, he's traveling around the United States uh, in the 18 teens, and he explains in one story about how he's traveling down the eastern seaboard, and he's gone from Philadelphia to Baltimore, and then he comes to Washington, D.C., and when he gets to Washington, D.C., he goes to a shop and he's trying to buy a pair of gloves that are 50 cents. And he attempts to pay for the 50 cent gloves with a dollar bill from Philadelphia. But the shopkeeper says, I'll only accept this Philadelphia bill 
uh, with a huge discount. You know, Philly's far enough away that I'm not going to give you face value. I'm going to give you a big discount on that. And so Fear and says, well, I don't want to do that. Um, how about this dollar note from Baltimore? Baltimore's a closer city to Washington. How about that? And then the shopkeeper says, that's fine. I'll take the Baltimore note without the big discount, but I don't have any small change. No shin plasters around, no coins. Um, so I'll take the dollar bill that you're handing me from Baltimore, but I'm going to rip it in half and just hand you back half of a ripped note as the change uh, with your gloves. And so Fearon is questioning this, but he winds up accepting the transaction. Uh, Fearon notes that uh, while this is odd to him, as he travels around the country, he sees a number of people uh, circulating these so-called demi notes uh, in lieu of small change. Uh, here, the rip note actually works as a 50 cent piece. Most of the ways that individuals manipulated bills uh, was by writing or uh, stamping the back of them. Many notes, especially uh, in the era before the 1850s, were only printed on one side and the backs made convenient spaces for the public to add their own advertisements, poetry, political slogans, or personal confessions. Like a graffiti artist, banknote holders utilized paper currency as a platform to forge connections between themselves and the wider community. Uh, this is the back of a note from the Jersey Manufacturing and Banking Company from Hoboken, New Jersey. Uh, what we see on the back of this note is a stamp for Leonard Bond's hat warehouse uh, on Canal Street in New York City. Uh, Leonard Bond was a hat manufacturer. Um, he had several different warehouses in New York over, over dozens of years. Uh, he was also an aggressive advertiser, not only in newspapers, uh, but when banknotes would come into his warehouse, he would stamp the backs of them uh, with advertisements for his warehouse so that when he gave the notes out as change, uh, and when someone bought one of his hats, uh, it was a ready-made advertisement as the notes continued to circulate around New York City. Uh, one interesting thing about this note is that the note itself is dated 1828, but the stamp on the back comes from a, a hat warehouse that uh, Leonard Bond had about 15 years later, well after the Jersey Manufacturing and Banking Company had gone out of business. Uh, either the note itself stayed in circulation, which was probable, uh, or Bond just sort of got some of these old uncirculating notes and decided to use them as advertising billboards. Uh, either way, he's sort of, uh, you know, repurposing these old notes uh, for his own advertisements. Other types of writing on, back, uh, on the backs of banknotes could actually reference the banknote itself, a sort of self-referential note on the back of a note. Uh, this is a note on the back of an Exchange Bank of Tennessee note from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Uh, questions arose about whether or not the, the, this note was of good quality, was a note that should be trusted, and someone had written on the back of it, this is a damn good bill. Uh, in an attempt to either uh, convince someone or maybe reassure themselves that this is a note that should uh, not only pass, but maybe pass uh, at, at face value. Uh, other notes, uh, you know, contained these similar sort of references, not to the good quality of a note, but maybe questions about notes uh, that weren't so good. Um, I know this is tough to read, uh, but what we see on the back of this shin plaster from a, a Ohio, Dayton, Ohio builder named Thomas Morrison is a, is a note uh, with a long diatribe. I'm gonna read it quickly to you. It says, ever since Van Buren has been president, the country has been infested with this trash. Jackson tinkered with the currency so much, it robbed the people of a met the metallic kind that, these, that, that they had and these damn rags was necessary to be printed. Huzzah for democracy, signed a holder. Here, a person annoyed that they're using a poor quality, low denomination shin plaster writes a long political diatribe on the back, blaming Van Buren and Jackson for the quality of the paper money in his hand. 
Another note uh, with a political bent um, could also be uh, personal. Uh, this is a farmer's exchange bank note from Gloucester, Rhode Island. And on the back of it, it contains an odd, um, an odd line. Uh, it says, Colonel Lucifer with his imps of federalism on the lying scout election squad. Uh, it's, it's a very strange uh, line. Uh, I spent a very long time trying to figure out both what it was, and I actually traced the line to a dead of Massachusetts doctor named Nathaniel Ames. Um, now, Nathaniel Ames is a Democratic Republican. He's also the brother of leading Federalist Fisher Ames, who he does not get along with. Uh, Nathaniel did not like the Federalists, often referred to them as the Federals, and the note on the back of this banknote seems to be some kind of attack on the Federalist Party, maybe aimed at his brother Fisher, uh, maybe on a note that he got from or handed to Fisher, it's hard to know. Uh, but here what we see is again a private sort of personal message, albeit one maybe of a political bent, on a banknote being circulated uh, very early uh, in the 1800s. All of these types of messages are relevant um, because as people interacted with these notes, it's important to remember that none of these banknotes or shin plasters are legal tender. Uh, these notes circulate by the consent of whoever is accepting them. Uh, there is no law, there is no sort of legislation saying that anyone has to accept a banknote in payment or has to accept a shin plaster in payment. And so what you see in this uh, sort of ongoing struggle between banknote producers and banknote holders is an attempt by banknote producers to create a banknote that can circulate and circulate for a long time, and banknote holders trying to decide, well, what is a good note? What is a bad note? What is a note that I can use, even if it might be a bad note? Should I give my confidence to this note? How can I accumulate enough monetary information to make these types of decisions? These are difficult uh, sort of decisions to make, um, and they hinge on whether an individual is going to uh, you know, provide confidence to the note in front of them. For the banks, these types of decisions made by banknote holders are vital because if their notes can't circulate or won't circulate, uh, their institution probably can't survive. The notes are the public face of the institution and therefore their success is, is vital. This dance between bankers and banknote holders you know, lasts for about 75 years in the early Republic until the pressures of the Civil War forces an end to the banknote system. Uh, what we get during the Civil War instead are new types of paper currencies that are gonna be backed by the federal government stepping in to provide more power and more oversight to the paper money world uh, in order to try and stabilize, stabilize currency during the war. Uh, by 1862, what we see are the creation of these legal tender notes spelled right out in the language on the note itself. These notes are nicknamed greenbacks because of the unique green color used on their back. Uh, con uh, similarly, the Confederates uh, put out um, their own notes, uh, which were nicknamed graybacks uh, at the same time. But these legal tender notes, as it says right on the, on the note here, have to be accepted. These are legal tender for all debts, public and private, with a few exceptions. And so unlike you know, the banknotes and shimplasters that preceded them, they have the banking and oversight of the federal government and in theory are universally accepted by law. These uniform bills that you know, look the same, they promise uh, whether or not you, know, you can get someone to take it, but they promise to circulate anywhere um, in the country without their value being based on personal negotiations or the de uh, demographics of the parties involved. It doesn't matter in theory who you are or where you are, this is a $1 bill that is legal tender from the federal government. By 1863, this model of uniform national paper currency even extends to fractional currency, 
Uh, here we see a note put to put forward uh, by the federal government that's a three cent fractional uh, note. Uh, initially, it was receivable for US stamps. Later, you could uh, collect a bunch of these and trade them in for greenbacks. Uh, so the federal government is putting out not only um, legal tender notes, but also small denomination fractional notes. In terms of bank notes, state bank notes during the Civil War are replaced during um, a series of legislation, the National Currency Act of 1863 and the National Banking Act of 1864, with national banknotes. What we see are state banknotes being replaced by a national banking system that ties these banks together under one set of regulations and one currency that is individually branded, but will be accepted all over the country at face value. So I wanna close with a couple of quick examples of this. This is a banknote, state banknote from before the Civil War from the Millers River Bank in Athol, Massachusetts, $3 note. You see it's individually branded. It's individually got a vignette. This is what a state bank note looked like from this bank in 1860. In 1865, the Millers River Bank joins the national banking system and becomes uh, the Millers River National Bank of Athol with uh, charter number 708. The Millers River National Bank of Athol pl puts out a $5 bill that looks like this. No longer do we see local or regional economic uh, vignettes. What we see are national and patriotic imagery, an image of Columbus on the left-hand side and an image of, in theory, a Native American princess representing uh, you know, America, supposedly on the right, each one labeled 1492 on it. This note is identical, it's uniform to other national currency from other national banks put out at the same time in 1865. Just a couple of months later, we see a note from, for example, the Deep River National Bank in Connecticut here. What you see is that these notes are identical with the exception of the change in branding. The Deep River National Bank uh, language replaces the Millers River National Bank uh, of Athol language as I go back and forth. But you can see that the vignettes and the patriotic imagery are the same as, well, as these banks are uniform uh, under one set of regulations and acceptable across the United States at, in theory at par. These uniform paper currencies meant a radical change for the public's relationship to their money. They no longer needed to glean monetary information about the health of the bank from the paper currency itself. Confidence in individual notes was no longer needed because it was the federal government, not the individual branch that was banking them, that was backing them. However, an important side effect of this uniform face value currency was that it was no longer necessary for the public to engage with paper money to accumulate the kind of monetary information that they used to need. Ultimately, Americans lost an important source of knowledge about banking and the mechanics of the economy when they no longer had to scrutinize every bill that came into their hand. Thank you so much for listening, uh, and I really appreciate uh, you coming out today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I know that we have uh, a good number of questions here. Um, so I think that we can probably get, get started. Um, so there is a question here from uh, Richard. Um, and thank you, by the way, Joshua, for a great presentation. It was also uh, a lot of fun visuals. So that was, that was cool things to see, including some stuff from the MHS collection. Um, Richard said, can you comment on the role of Boston's Suffolk Bank in establishing confidence in Boston banks' notes uh, and the political context of Federalist versus Republican banks? Uh, yeah, I'll, the, I'll take the, the Suffolk model uh, in, in particular. The, what happened in the Boston and, and much of New England area is that the, the Suffolk Bank basically set up a mini central bank system where individual banks from, the, sort of from around New England 
would put money on deposit at the Suffolk Bank. And this would allow them to be part of a network in, within the Suffolk Bank system uh, where their notes could circulate at face value within the system as long as they were a member of the Suffolk Bank system. And the Suffolk would therefore, uh, you know, sort of operate in order to allow these banks to sort of uh, banknotes to sort of come in and move around New England all at face value. And the system worked quite well. It, it starts in the 1820s and it works into the 1850s uh, quite well. It even helps uh, New England and a lot of the banks in it sort of weather, uh, you know, the economic downturn of the Panic of 1837 much better than the rest of the country. But the problem with the Suffolk system was that it provided sort of a false sense of confidence for the member institutions. Um, what happened is a lot of the members feel like because they're members of the Suffolk and their banknote um, sort of face value notes are being protected, they can issue as many notes as they want uh, within reason uh, because they have the sort of backing of the Suffolk system. Uh, by the 1850s, what you start to see are all these criticisms of the Suffolk system uh, because uh, New England banks are issuing huge numbers of, of notes, especially in lower denominations and dumping them in the Midwest and dumping them you know, out of the New England region because everyone thinks they're from New England, they're holding their value. But if you sort of look under the hood, there are a lot of questions about how good these banks really are. Uh, eventually the Suffolk model will be challenged by sort of an upstart model of a bunch of other banks under the leadership of something called the Bank of Mutual Redemption, uh, which sounds a little bit like a, a sort of a cult. Um, and they wind up sort of coming into existence and challenging the Suffolk and the Suffolk model crumbles almost overnight uh, because there's sort of scrutiny and challenge to it. So it's an interesting system and does manage for a while anyway uh, to keep you know, the banknotes circulating quite uh, favorably and at face value for much of New England. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of sort of trouble under the hood uh, by, the, by the 1850s. I'm sorry, there was another question about um, so, federalist versus democratic banks, I think. Yeah, so uh, establishing confidence in Boston banknotes and the political context of federalist versus Republican banks. Yeah, I mean, sort of the, there's a wider uh, sort of story here, which is that a lot of banks, um, you know, have ties to either, uh, you know, individuals who might be players within political parties um, and or, you know, in certain places you have political parties sort of active in either chartering banks or working in, uh, you know, to, to make legislative changes uh, for banking legislation. You might have, you know, a place like, um, I'm just thinking of sort of a different example, but in certain places, you know, Whigs might uh, support legislation which leads to you know more banks and more banknotes, whereas uh, Democrats by the 1830s or 40s, or at least some Democrats, are trying to restrict banks and banknotes because they think of them as dangerous uh, for working people because they become devalued. And so there's you know there's these, this interesting interplay between you know the the politics and how the politics of banking plays out legislatively and in terms of you know party politics. Um, and also what this means for individuals, you know, when individuals face, you know, something like the bank war, you know, their experiences living with these notes uh, go a long way to how they're going to come down on either side of, you know, of, you know, Jackson and, and, and the National Bank. It's not always what you would expect, but it's based on, you know, the individual lived experience they have with banknotes and, and, you know, and what it's like to be a banknote holder. So Jerry wrote, um, was there any effort to regulate insurance of banknotes or was it strictly uh, caveat emptor? For example, did some uh, jurisdictions uh, require that banks be authorized to issue banknotes or were there limits um, on the face value of notes that could be issued perhaps tied to the institution's assets? There are, there are a ton of those and they vary. Every state has different laws and they're constantly changing. One of the reasons banking is so complicated in this time period is that because it's on the state model, uh, you know, you have dozens of different versions of state banking and they change over time. Uh, in certain states, you get what are called safety funds. Uh, basically, uh, you know, the law saying that banks have to uh, sort of, you know, pay into a fund to act almost like an FDIC would today, sort of to protect banknote holders if the bank goes under. 
The problem is in the places that do this, or at least some of the places that do this, is that you know the financial um, circumstances when banks start to go under are often economic downturns when lots of banks go under all at once. And so those safety funds, while they you know they make sense as an idea, they get overwhelmed in you know in reality. Um, you know, in, in a place, you know, like Michigan, uh, during during the, the first, uh, the, during the panic of 1837, when you have so many banks failing at once, um, you know, it really stretches the ability of, of a system like that to keep up. Um, other banks have legislation saying that an, a bank can only issue three or four times in face value the notes, uh, uh, the notes value that they have in gold and silver held in their own vaults, right? So that at least they'll be able to redeem a certain you know, percentage. So other states don't have those types of limitations and a lot of people sort of cheat the limitations by tricking regulators into thinking they have more in their vaults than they really do. And it's this constant game played by bankers to uh, evade the regulations. So there are regulations, they vary by state, but they're constantly um, sort of under threat and, and uh, being undermined by sort of unscrupulous bankers. <laughs> Sounds like a wild, a wild system. <laughs> so Liet, I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly, said, uh, could you say a little bit about the engraving and printing trades producing banknotes, including commerce and plates and eventually modular elements? I also, um, sort of as an addendum to this, I was very uh, interested in the Santa Claus uh, notes um, and we recently um, mounted an exhibition on the history of political cartoons um, and talked a lot about Thomas Nast popularizing the modern day uh, image of Santa Claus. Right. Uh, and I'm sort of wondering when those banknotes were printed. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of ruining this person's legitimate question by asking another question. So how about we start with his question <laughs> and say, uh, yeah, uh, the, say about the engraving and printing? It's, it's really great and it's a, it's a complicated question because there are all sorts of different, um, you know, engraving, uh, you know, printing, banker printing firms and they change over time and they get, you know, more corporatized, um, you know, over the course of the century. Um, the other thing to, to mention here that sort of plays into your question is that, that you know, the, the, the artwork is beautiful and a lot of, you know, you know, of the, the really beautiful engraving is often done by you know artists who you know might have other careers or sort of you know side careers as you know painters or sculptors you know doing work that would be more familiar maybe to people of this era. Uh, there are several members of say the Hudson Valley uh, you know school uh, you know of painting that are also working at the same time as banknote engravers. Um, you know so you you can see in you know that some of this plays out in sort of. Uh, wider, you know, aesthetics, I talk about this, you know, in the book, but sort of wider, um, you know, sort of um, understandings about aesthetics and, and what it means for sort of public consumption of art uh, in the banknote sort of vignettes themselves. Uh, the, 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 mere, the, the sort of marrying of classical imagery and landscapes uh, are done in certain ways that do mirror, uh, you know, Hudson Valley School art in, in certain ways because it's related to the same individuals who are doing this. So that's sort of one component. There's another sort of technical component of this where you have engravers making technological advancements, you know, really, really intricate lathe uh, work done on some of the notes. I didn't get into sort of showing a lot of those today, but some of the geometric designs are from really sort of fancy lathe work that, that's being done, you know, by engravers, you know, that are making sort of um, unbelievable sort of technological advancements in engraving and, and they're using uh, sort of banknotes as the, the palette, right, to, to sort of show that, that, um, that artwork, um, you know, to the public. Uh, another side of this is the corporate side is that when, you know, when a, when a firm creates a, a banknote plate, um, as you said, it's become sort of modular. So the same types of, vin the same vignettes pop up often on different banknotes, sometimes out of context, right? You can have a banknote that creates note, uh, vignettes that are, you know, make sense for that note. And then when the next bank comes along and use the same, uses the same engraver and uses the same vignette, it can look completely out of whack. You know, a picture of, of the, you know, the Ni of Niagara Falls on a note from Georgia just doesn't make any sense. Uh, but you know, you you might try and cobble together a note like that if you like that if you were doing it cheaply. And count books about counterfeiting at the time warn 
uh, the public that if you see a note where the you know the, the vignettes don't really work or uh, you know something doesn't seem right with with the context, this may be a clue, although it's not necessarily that maybe it's a counterfeit, right? You know, it's sort of something to be aware of as you're using the note itself to accumulate monetary information. So, um, just out of curiosity, when were the um, the Santa Claus? notes printed? Uh, they're pre-Civil War. I mean, all these new ones are, and there's tons of them from the 1840s, 1850s. I can think of six or seven right off the top of my head, and they're all different Santas. I mean, part of what you're saying is that, you know, these these early Republic Santas, you know, have very different looks to them. There's one in particular I can think of that's really creepy. It's like, he's sort of like sneaking into the children's room, and it's a, it's a very creepy Santa image, but, you know, it sort of appears on a bank, and you're like, okay, I, you know, great. <laughs> but, like, that's creepy. Okay, so I think we have time for one last question. So Peter wrote, uh, the Massachusetts Historical Society has a Brook Farm five-cent note. I have assumed uh, that note circulated within the utopian community, but some of your examples make me think otherwise. Your thoughts? This is, of course, yeah. Peter Grubby from NHS. <laughs> right, yeah, I know, I know the note that you're talking about, and, you know, that individual communities like that. There's several utopian communities that sort of issue their own uh, paper money. And uh, I know Josiah Warren, who, who, who sets up a, a number of utopian uh, sort of, you know, uh, communities also, they're, they're based on, on, a, on a sort of paper money uh, banking system or paper money economy, I should say. So those would circulate internally. Uh, I don't have any sense that they would circulate outside of the community unless to maybe a vendor who dealt with the community who was then gonna bring it right back to the community. I guess that could be possible. It was with the, what, the notes from the Josiah Warren community because it's sort of a community within a town and you're working within the town, but his notes particularly sort of are, are, are valued in labor as an equivalent to, to dollars. Uh, whereas that Brook Farm one, I, is, it's a much more rudimentary, um, type, you know, what I would call a sort of a, a utopian shin plaster meant for that community. Great. Well, I want to be conscious of people's time. I know that lots of people are, are about to have dinner, depending on uh, where they are in the country. Um, I want to thank you for a, a great program. And uh, Catherine? Oh, thank you so much, Joshua. This is great. I always think the best historical research and then the best programs take us back to a world where things we just assumed were the way they've always been weren't. And you just gave us a glimpse into that world. Thank you. That was great. And I'll never think of Santa in exactly the same way. <laughs> Thank you both so much. I really enjoyed this. It was, it was really a pleasure. Thank you. Um, and uh, just let them know that we do actually have a 30% discount um, through the University of Pennsylvania Press uh, on Joshua's book. So if you've enjoyed uh, this evening's program, I hope you'll consider buying a copy.